This is Dr. Ray Henry, and thank you for joining us on the Moment of Destiny broadcast. David exhorts us in Psalm 103 to bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Today, we're going to build our own personal blessing box. And in it, we're going to put the blessings of God, the benefits of God, the promises of God. And when we do, our lives are going to be full of praise and joy and happiness. And thank you if you're watching by TV. We thank you for uh, paying attention and the times that we broadcast our program. And uh, we value your watching this and we pray God will bless you and that you'll come visit us one day here at Belvedere Baptist Church. So now if you have your Bibles, we want you to turn to Psalm 103. And we're going to talk today about how to develop or make the blessing box, the blessing box. Now all through these Psalms 100, 101, 2, and 3, it talks about the blessings that God has given to us and He wants us to be thankful for him and all that he means to us. Someone said it like this, we are a blessed nation, but we're not much of a thankful nation. God wants us to be a thankful nation that praises him for all of his goodness and grace in our life. Psalm 103 verse 1, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. Forget not all of his grace and goodness and the many, many things that he does for you and your family. Forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all of thine iniquities and heals all of your diseases who redeems thy life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that the youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our own sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Now, many people in our day do not look to these holidays, these Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, as a time to give honor and glory to the Lord uh, for what he has done for us. As a matter of fact, if you listen to most people, uh, they're more interested in Black Friday uh, or Cyber Monday after Thanksgiving, Black Friday the day after Thanksgiving. They're more interested in these sales days when they can get a bargain. But God is interested in our response to all of his graciousness and his mercy and his love and his benefits. Don't forget his benefits that he's given to you in your life. And we oftentimes do that. Sometimes we see in our school system, we hear it from our students of historians that are writing the books that are taught in our schools. They are called revisionist, revisionist. They are rewriting history. Uh, instead of saying about what actually happened there in those first colonies in which the people turned to God and gave him the glory for helping them to survive that trip across the sea, the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, enable them to, to start a new nation here in America. They have revived history and made it sound like something completely different than what actually happened there. Here's an example of one colony. After the first year of settlement at the Plymouth Colony, on September the 16th, 1620, Governor William Bradford proclaimed a day of thanksgiving 
even though 51 of the 103 original settlers had died. They still wanted to have a day of thanksgiving. Now they were debating over having either a day of mourning to mourn these friends and family that had died, a day of mourning or a day of thanksgiving. That's actually fact. That's our real history. And they decided that since they had had a fairly decent crop of food, they had planted seed and they had just a decent crop of food and, and they were getting along with the Indians okay, that they would have a day of praise and thanksgiving one year later as to what God had done for them uh, during that first year. Now, some are trying to rewrite that history into something else. But in actuality, each one of these colonies set aside a day of praise, a day of thanksgiving, where they honored the sovereign God for overlooking all the problems, all the challenges that they faced in life. And they wanted to give God the praise and give God the glory. Again, what I said just earlier, that we are a blessed nation, but we are not a thankful nation. I heard the story about an old farmer that had come into town to, uh, to sell his crops, and he went by the local restaurant to get a meal. And before all of his meals, he just bows and, and he says a word of thanks and praise to God for enabling him uh, to have a good crop. And so uh, there were some teenage boys that were sitting not too far from him. And they laughed at him as he, he bowed and verbally out loud gave a prayer of thanks for what God meant to him and God was doing for him in his life. And they started laughing. One of them spoke up and says, Oh man, old farmer, does everybody back where you come from do that? Does everybody where you come from do that? And the old farmer, wise old farmer says, No. Not everybody. The hogs, the hogs, they don't do that. They just dive in. And I'm afraid in America, we have a lot of people, of unthankful people. We're a blessed nation, but we're not a thankful nation. And God is looking for a small group of people that will honor him with thankfulness and praise for what he has done for us. Uh, Corrie Ten Boone talks about her early upbringing uh, in the Ten Boone family. She said that uh, near their dinner table, uh, they had a blessing box. They call it the blessing box. It was a small tin box uh, situated not too far from the kitchen table, from the dining room table. And whenever God had done something special in their life, had blessed them in a special way, maybe uh, Papa Ten Boone had sold one of his expensive clocks and they got a little extra money or something. Uh, the mother, usually the mother, would take some change and some money and she would put it in the blessing box. And after about a year, they would take that money and send it to their special missions that they supported. And they called it the blessing box. Every time God gave them an unexpected blessing, maybe somebody came to visit them or to stay with them, they would put money in the blessing box. And Corrie Ten Boom talked about one lady that had come to spend the night with them. She was the sister-in-law of one of the preachers that they knew in that town. And this sister-in-law came and and asked to spend the night there in the Ten Boone family. And she heard Papa Ten Boone at the dinner table give thanks for her. Thank you, Lord, for allowing so-and-so to come and be with us during this time and bless her. And we thank you for her. And then she heard that after the meal, somebody went over to that blessing box and they put in some money thanking God that she was there with them and fellowshipping with, with them. It made a difference in her life. One of the aunts had gone up to see her to see if everything was okay in her room and what have you. And she noticed a sheet had been rolled up into making a rope. And the aunt said to this sister-in-law, the preacher that was staying with them, she said, what is this? What, what are you trying to do? What is this uh, thing that you're making? And the girl confessed to this aunt. 
She said, I came here to end my life. I have no reason for living. And I was going to take this sheet rolled up to look like a, a rope made into a rope. And I was going, she was in the top room. I was going to jump out the window and hang myself. But she said, after hearing Papa Tin Boone's prayer tonight at the dinner table, where he thanked God for me, of all people, he's thanking God for me. And then I heard that somebody put some money in the blessing box on my behalf and for me being there. They were thanking God that she was visiting with them. And when I saw that happen, and I saw that my life must count for something if they appreciate me that much, and I decided not to do what I came here to do. The blessing box made a tremendous difference in her life. Now this morning, if you had a blessing box in your home, what would you put in it? What would you put in your blessing box? Of the many different benefits, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. What are some benefits this morning that you would put in your blessing box? I want to give you some suggestions of some benefits that God has already given to you in Jesus Christ. I want to suggest some things that you can put in your blessing box today. Most of us know the story of Gulliver's Travels with popular book, Gulliver's Travels. There was a law of the Lilliputians in that Gulliver's Travel, in that book. It was called Ingratitude is a Capital Offense. If somebody in that town was expressing complaining and ingratitude, uh, then that was breaking their law. And so oftentimes in life, we're, we're, we're full of complaints and grumbling and grudges that we hold against other people rather than praising God for what uh, he has done for us. Somebody said it like this. He said, we ought to have one day to complain about things in our life. And then we ought to have 364 days to give thanks. Rather than just having one day of Thanksgiving, we ought to have 364 days of Thanksgiving and one day to complain. Now, God wants us to honor him, glorify him for all the many good things that he has done for us. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. So what would you put in your blessing box? Let me give you some suggestions that's found in our text. Number one, we need to thank God for the blessing of our salvation. Thank God if you're saved. Thank God for the blessing of being born again and a part of the kingdom of God. Psalm 103, verse 3, Who forgives? God forgives all of our sins and heals your diseases and redeems you from the pit, the pit of punishment. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, Paul said it like this, Thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift. And what is he talking about here? He's talking about the gift of eternal life. We, can, we don't have words that are adequate enough to thank God for what he has done for us when he redeems us from our sins. Thank God for this indescribable gift. Uh, I don't even really have the vocabulary to word and to say the many blessings of what he means to me in life. This is what Paul th says. Thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift. Now in Psalm 103, uh, the psalmist says it like this. Who forgives all your sins and he redeems your life from the pit. And then verse 12. As far as the east is from the west and they never meet. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. So first of all, we need to thank him for his love his mercy, and his forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Paul says, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then again he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And workmanship means that God 
has recreated us, has made us a new person in Jesus Christ. Only Christ can make you a new person. Can today you put the blessing of salvation in your blessing box? Can you put that in your blessing box? Thank God that there is a point in time and where I realized that I was a sinner that had fallen way short of what God wanted me to be, and I turned my attention to the cross, and I trusted Christ's atoning death for my sins. Can I ask you the big question? Can you look at a point in time in which you placed your trust, not in yourselves, but in Jesus Christ alone, His perfect righteousness, he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. His righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, perfect righteousness, is placed on our account. Our sins is placed on Jesus in His death on the cross, taking the penalty of sin, and in His burial and resurrection in defeating sin, and defeating the penalty of sin, which is death. He took upon himself this penalty in order that we might have eternal life. Can you look back in your life to a point in time in which you made that great transaction of salvation where your life was made a new creation in Christ Jesus? You know, when Christ comes into your life, there is a supernatural change. This is what he meant when he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. I see you got all these religious laws, Nicodemus, and you are a rabbi, a teacher of rabbis, and yet you need a spiritual birth. You've kept these religious laws, but you do not have forgiveness of your sins now, he knew all about that in the Passover feast, what it represented. You need to be born again. For God so loved the world, he told Nicodemus. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, has there ever been a point in time in which you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone? If so, you can put salvation in that blessing box. If not, you need to make that great transaction today. Does it make a difference when you accept Christ? Does it make a difference? We were taking a, a team out teaching them how to share the gospel in one of the churches in the past that I pastored. And we came to the home of Ricky Harris and uh, Ricky Harris didn't even invite us in to come and share. We, he had visited our church. We were returning the visit to him and, and we were going to share the gospel and he wouldn't even let us in the screen door. So we just shared the gospel with Ricky through the screen door and how he could be made a different person, how his sins could be forgiven if he placed his faith in Jesus Christ. And, and then we thanked him for letting us share the good news with him. And then we left. But we made an appointment. Hey, Ricky, can we come back in a week and see how you're doing, see if you need anything? We went back seven days later. And Ricky, this time, opens the door, invites us in. He tells us this, you won't believe what's happened to me. I did what you told me to do, standing at that door, sharing the gospel and how I needed to receive Christ as my personal Savior and to acknowledge my sin and accept Christ as my personal Savior and Lord. I did that that night and God changed me. We knew nothing about this. We didn't know anything about Ricky either. But he says, you know what's happened? During the week, I quit cursing. I just stopped cursing altogether. And also during the week, uh, I had been used to using certain drugs. And I put those drugs aside. And during the week, God filled me with His joy and His peace. And I would go to work just full of love and peace and happiness. 
And they began to call me happy. They began to call me happy for something had happened to me. We are a new workmanship in Christ Jesus. When he comes into your heart and forgives you of your sin and gives you peace with God, the Bible says you are a new creature. It means a new creation. There is something different about your life. Can you put the blessing of salvation in your blessing box? I know that there was a point in time in which I trusted Christ as my personal Savior. I had no other hope. I could find no other peace with God except transferring my trust to Jesus Christ. Is the blessing of salvation in your home? The second thing that we see that we can, that we can put in our home is the blessing of His strength, the blessing of God's strength, Christ's strength, in our life. Paul puts it like this in 1 Timothy 1.12. I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has strengthened me. You remember Paul got saved on the Damascus Road. And then God called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And he was a devout Jew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And yet God called him to go into these various cities on his first, second, and third missionary journeys and to share the gospel. And everywhere he went to, he was opposed and challenged and beaten. But God gave him the strength to endure all the opposition that he went through. Listen to some things that Paul said that he went through as a Christian sharing the good news. Listen to what he says. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Are there servants of Christ? I more. I have worked much harder, been in prisons more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. They couldn't give him 40 because he was a Jew and he was a Roman citizen. So they had to take one of those lashes off and only give him 39. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times was I shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in dangers from rivers, dangers from bandits, in dangers from my own countrymen that wanted to kill me, in danger of the Gentiles, in danger in the city, dangers in the country, dangers in the sea, and in danger from false brethren. I have labored and toiled and have gone often without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone, gone without food. I have been cold and I have been naked. All of these things that Paul went through, but he says in the midst of it, the Lord has strengthened me and gave me the power to see me through these great challenges and trials of my faith. Now, I like the song by Annie J. Flint. It's called, He Gives More Grace. Listen to the words. He giveth more grace. He gives more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sins more when the labors increase. To added affliction, he adds his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is even half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's giving is only begun. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. He giveth and giveth and giveth again. Paul depended upon God to see him through and to give him the strength that he needs in life. And he'll see you through no matter what you're going through in life. So the second blessing that you can put in your blessing box, you need to make one, we all need to make one, is the blessing of his strength. The blessing of his strength. The third one, the third blessing is the blessing of fellow saints, fellow Christians who are a blessing to us. In every one of his epistles, Paul is thanking God 
for Christian and after Christian in these cities that have enabled him to do the work and establish churches in those cities. To the Romans, he says, I thank God through Jesus for all of you. To the Corinthians, I thank my God always concerning you. To the Ephesians, I do not cease to give thanks for you. And we need to thank God for what he has done for us. Do you thank God for the people that he has put in your life? Some of us are like the people in this poem that I read about. Oh, to dwell above in heaven. Oh, to dwell above with saints we love. That will be glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. And God wants us to be grateful for the people that he has put in your life. It is no accident for the people, whether it's family or friends or workmates or church members that you know, God has purposely put these people in your life to help you through the Christian life and to strengthen you and to be a blessing for. Do you complain about them or do you thank God for those that he has purposely put in your life to enable you and to help you live a fruitful uh, Christian life. He's put those people to help you in life. Do you look upon your friends and colleagues as a blessing? Can you put in that blessing box the gift of other saints that God has put in your life? In every epistle that Paul writes, he lists from six to over a dozen people that have helped him fulfill his mission. Start thanking God for those good things that he's given to you. What can you put in your blessing box? What do you need to start putting in your blessing box this morning? Question. Could you put in that gift of salvation that God offers to all of us? That is, can you look back at a point in time in which you received Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior and Lord? If you're not sure about that, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Pray it right now. Dear God, I know you love me. You sent your only begotten Son to die on a cross for my sins. He took my sins upon himself. He took the penalty of sin, death, and he overcame them in his resurrection. Now I take you, Jesus Christ, to be my Savior. Come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, and give me your Holy Spirit as a sign that you have accepted me and you have forgiven me. Now, if you prayed a prayer like that, we want to hear from you. There's a number on your screen. Please call us. We want to contact you and give you some material. And most of all, we'd love to see you this coming Sunday. Many of you don't have a church home. We want to be your church home. Come this Sunday at 11 a.m. You'll be welcome.